Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, welcome everybody. This is um, a SIEM webinar to be hosted by uh, Rosalie Hocking. So Rosalie is currently uh, working at uh, Swinburne University of Technology um, in the Department of Chemistry and Biotechnology. Um, she is also a member of SIEM. She is a Vice Chancellor's Women's uh, in STEM Fellow and, and also a Senior Lecturer and her um, background with respect to the seminar today. She's uh, an expert in uh, synchrotron radiation and is passionate about studying um, chemical reactions of carbon dioxide, nitrogen and, and water, which is key to developing a, a carbon neutral economy. Um, so without further ado, um, please, Rosalie, uh, we look forward to your seminar. Thanks, Peter. Um, can I just check everyone can see my slides? Because I can't tell. Um, so I've, I've entitled my talk today, Structural Disorder in Metal Oxides from Catalyst to Novel Surface Properties. And I essentially wanted to share with you some of my journey in studying catalysts over the last sort of you know decade. And I also wanted to reach a point where I talked to you about some of the fundamentally interesting and different properties disordered materials can have. And I also want to share with you why I think they can be useful. I've tried to incorporate into my talk a little bit about techniques because fundamentally I'm a technique expert. I've worked a lot at the Australian Synchrotron using X-ray techniques. And I want to explain to you sort of in passing in the context of my research, I suppose, why these things are useful and what you can get out of them. So. You can ask, feel free to ask me any questions about those um, as well. Where I start my talk today, I, I want to talk to you about some of the challenges we have around energy science. So at the moment, there's a lot of talk about um, sustainability and clean energy technology, meaning how do we generate energy without putting CO2 into the atmosphere? How do we generate key commodity products without putting CO2 in the atmosphere? Um, and these are really fundamental and really important questions. I think one of the really important things that's come out of the last 15 years is that we can actually generate electricity fairly cheaply without producing CO2. And that might come as a bit of a surprise to everyone, but you know, we can put solar cells on our roofs and we're pretty good at generating electricity. And also, if you look at the Victorian baseload, we also get a really substantial baseload from wind. But one of the fundamental problems with both solar derived electricity and also wind is that they are intermittent, which might seem simplistic, but it, it's extremely problematic because if you're in the business of maintaining a, a grid electricity supply, you need a fairly constant source of the different components. So if you're running a coal fired power plant, what you really want is to have a consistent power demand, not, you know, one that has to ramp up at 5 p.m. when the sun sets. There's also a big elephant in the room that's not just about CO2 reduction, some of that's also about commodity product manufacture. Not all of our CO2 is in is in um, energy, some of it's in products that we make. Everything from polymers to metals requires a lot of CO2 and so it's useful to think about how we might begin to overcome some of the challenges in those manufactured products. I've put here what I consider to be kind of a vision of um, future commodity product manufacture. At the moment, the one on the top here, hydrogen, it gets a lot of good press. We're going to make electrolyzers and make hydrogen. And we talk about ammonia a lot at the moment. It's become CSIRO's got a patent on um, actually taking um, ammonia and making um, hydrogen. So they, they think these processes can be reversible. But I've also put here some other ones and I put them here because I think they're important for Australia. Um, we refine some metals in Australia, probably not as many as we could. And re metal refining is a place where we do use a lot of electricity. So if we could think about ways to make some of those processes with these things, I think that would be really, really good. There are other products that you buy in everyday use, things like bleach and ozone. They are also manufactured electrolytically. So you can think about ways we might start to, sorry, I'm having a few Teams problems, guys. It's kind of hanging. Um, you can think about ways we might think about how to improve these products. One of the solutions we have in commodity product manufacture is if we can actually find ways to basically divert the electricity to make the products we want. Um, and that might seem a little bit overly simplistic. So 
maybe many of you have applied electricity to water and split it into oxygen and hydrogen. And that happens because well, water's fundamental breakdown products are oxygen and hydrogen. But often you want to actually divert that electricity into something else, um, something that might have a bigger commodity value than oxygen and hydrogen. So as you also might imagine, there's a lot of work around the world in this particular area. Um, and so my little bit of this, I suppose, has been trying to understand these materials that are put onto the electrodes such that you can actually generate products out of them. So how do we find ways to actually make these products? How do we find ways to improve these products? Um, and how do we, you know, how do we make them selective for the products we want? Sorry guys, I've had some, my PowerPoint's crashed. I'm gonna reopen it. If you need to just unshare, reshare, we can we can do that as well. It might be actually a Teams problem. I've not had that problem with PowerPoint before. Anyway, my apologies for that. Stop sharing. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> leave there. I need a new computer. presentation mode and we should be good to go. Okay. Right. Great, that's coming through. My apologies for that. Um, I think we've had a few Teams problems and it's caused some of the software to hang. So as I mentioned, I, we really need to actually understand how to manufacture and how to begin to, I guess, generate such materials that could make these commodity products. For more than a, I'm going to say for more than 100 years, people have looked to nature in wonder at the reactions that nature does. And if you think about this in a very fundamental way, like, and even in a really basic way, you, you walk down the street and you see all this green everywhere. Um, you know, you're, what you're seeing is photosynthesis and you're actually seeing a very, very clever reaction of solar cells. So if you take the green, green um, leaves, they're actually able to harvest light and they're able to make some really useful commodity products. They can split water into oxygen and hydrogen and they can chemically reduce CO2 and make glucose. They are not the only important reaction that biology does. Biology is actually able to do a lot of chemical reactions that have interested us for a very long time. And they've been studied also for a very long time. In fact, I started my career maybe 20 years ago, actually studying these particular proteins to understand something about how they work. After decades of research, people were able to actually isolate the active sites of these proteins. And they, they looked at them and said, you know what, these things are really interesting. One of the things they do is they kind of look a lot like metal oxides. And an interesting observation that, that I want to make because it's pertinent to this work is that people went at this, which is the active side of the metalloprotein that um, I'm not using my laser pointer again. Uh, they looked at this, which is the active side of the metalloprotein and said, isn't it funky? It kind of looks like the really common metal oxide phase. And they did this with other things too. They did it with nitrogenase. They did it with McKinney. And they said, it's really funky. They look the same. 
And in the 80s and 90s, people actually checked these materials and they tested their activity as water oxidation catalysts. And they went, you know what, they kind of work a bit, but they're not very active and they moved on. In fact, an entire field moved on. And it moved on to looking at molecular systems. Okay, so um, our little systems a little bit like this. And this, uh, this little story I want to tell you leads into some of the things I want to talk about with regard to metal oxides, but it's a useful story to understand a little bit about how synchrotron work can be innovative in understanding and designing new materials. So um, around, well, it, it is about a decade ago, maybe a little bit more, Leon and his student Rob made a really active catalyst for water oxidation. And at the time it was a really, really exciting innovation because it was the first time anyone had been able to take a molecular compound. So that is something that has the metal, but also the organic part and actually make a catalyst that turned over. It wasn't a simple system because this guy didn't turn over by itself. It turned over when you put it into an organic polymer film on the surface of an electrode. And it was a really exciting system and people wanted to understand how it worked. Now, they had a lot of theories about how this system worked, but none of them had any evidence, I suppose, for them. Um, and at the time when they were studying this, I had just accepted a position at Monash University and um, I was asked to actually, I was actually working for the office of the DVCR, not for the chemistry department, and I was off my, I was tasked with the job of teaching Monash professors how to use the synchrotron. That was my brief. I had to spend time with lots of different professors and teach them how to use the synchrotron. And I actually thought a really interesting application of synchrotron radiation would be to try and sort out this system. So, and I thought there were a lot of really good reasons we wanted to know why it worked. And a little bit like where I started my talk, you can imagine that if you've got a catalyst that works, you want to know why it works, because if you want to make it better, one of the first steps to making something better is understanding how it works. So the technique that I was an expert in and that I'd had some experience in um, was a technique called X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So in an X-ray absorption spectroscopy experiment, you, you fundamentally do something quite simple that most of you are familiar with. You change your incoming wavelength of X-rays and then you measure absorption as a function of that wavelength. OK. And based on that, you get what we call an X-ray absorption spectrum. Now, I have an example of two X-ray absorption spectra here, and there are two compounds that differ by a redox state. So you can see here you have iron 3 tachyn and iron 2 tachyn, they're just two compounds, and you can see that one is shifted to higher energy relative to the other. There's additional features that are associated with the X-ray absorption spectra that can help you sort out a material. So you have these little features here that are related to the S to D transition. So they tell you about the electronic structure of the material. And then at some point you get enough energy that you spit all the electrons out of a material and you get essentially diffraction information. Now, I know all this stuff is kind of like, yeah, you can get that stuff. But probably what makes X-ray absorption spectroscopy special is that you can get that stuff on pretty much any material at all. So you can get that... Um, Sorry, guys, I'm having it's teens trying to be smart. <laughs> um, you can get that information on almost any material at all. So, for example, if you have like a soil or a sediment, you can actually put the soil or the sediment into the into the system and into the ex, into the um, spectrometer and study a particular metal in the soil. If you've got a functional material, you can home in on the function of that that particular metal function of a material. For this particular material, a lot of the ways they had postulated it worked were through little things like this. And this part of the XAS spectrum is particularly sensitive to looking at these interactions. So it's particularly sensitive to looking at things like um, man uh, manganese oxygen bonds or manganese manganese bonds because they produce quite distinct patterns in the XAS. So I knew that this would be a really good technique to try and get to the bottom of this system. Um, PowerPoint, please don't crash on me again. I'm sorry, guys, I've never had this problem before. PowerPoint just randomly crashing. I, I don't know. 
So my first in my first experiment, what I did was I took an electrode um, which we'd prepared and I was able to actually um, put it into a material and exchange in the organic component. So what we did was we, we tried to do an experiment that enabled us to emulate what what it is we were looking at on the on the system and put it into the the experiment. So we took a glass electrode and we which had the nafion on it and exchanged the cubane. We then applied a potential um, and then we looked at it and we looked at it at each stage of this process. So if you want to use an analytical technique to study a system, it is important that you're able to you know emulate the system that you want to study. In what we were doing. we were able to see some really interesting and distinct things. So if I go back to the system of building the catalyst, you've got your material on Nafion, you've got it exchanging into the material. And from that, what we had is we had Cubane to begin with, we had the material that was exchanged, and then we had the catalyst after it was made. And I had the spectra that I produced. So what I saw was where I started, the material chemically reduced, it went to manganese two, and it was oxidized back up again after we applied potential. Um, at that point, um, we were able to learn some things about the system. So if you look here, the material, you know, had these additional bumps in the XAS spectra. And at the time, I, what, I knew where the system had changed after it had reacted, but I was still trying to figure out how. So in parallel with my X-ray absorption experiments, I, I went back to the drawing board and remade the catalyst that um, Rob and Leon had made, but with some different precursors. And I was able to demonstrate that even with the different precursors, it produced essentially the same X-ray absorption spectra. Based on this, I was able to actually isolate the material. Oh, sorry, guys. <clears throat> I was able to tell that the material was likely to be a metal oxide, but I couldn't actually, I wanted to actually see if I could use XAS to work out which metal oxide it was. So just to give you an idea of how this works, um, if you if we know that some a metal oxide has an oxidation state of say three or four, and in this case it was around um, like, uh, I wanna say the oxidation state was around 3.8, we can actually isolate out the structures that we think it can be and we can actually tell from the XAS which one of those structures it is. So this particular layer structure here, burnicite, produces quite a distinct XAS compared to pyrolocyte, which is um, a rutile-like structure. And based on this, we can actually learn already that the material very likely has a layer structure a little bit like burnicite. I wasn't quite done with that material. I, I knew it was a photoelectrocatalyst, not just an electrocatalyst. So I wanted to understand the interaction of light. And so we were able to actually demonstrate that light interconverts this material. So when you actually shine light on it, you get manganese too, which is reoxidized back up to a material that is um, the active catalyst. We we're also able to, um, I, I knew with XAS, one of the things with analytical techniques is they don't work very well in isolation. Um, and so we actually, with a colleague, um, Sherry Chang, we were able to actually um, find a way to make TEM grids into electrodes because I knew if I was making a metal oxide as I had thought that I might be, in the oxidized state here, I should have been able to see particles in TEM. And I was indeed able to see particles in TEM. So based on that, I kind of learned that the material was breaking down and making itself into a metal oxide. And that was a really interesting observation that in fact, you'd actually made a really, really common metal oxide and that that was a really active water oxidation catalyst. And it's also funny because of where I started this story, which was people had kind of postulated for a long time that these metal oxides were, you know, looked a lot like photosystem too, but, you know, that we, we kind of dismissed the fact that they were, um, we dismissed them as being possible candidates as catalysts because we checked them and they weren't active. Yet this was a very, very active system. So 
in the intervening decade after I made this observation, we, we made a lot of different catalysts. In fact, it's actually a good thing if a catalyst is a metal oxide rather than a metal organic because they're much cheaper and you're in a much better position to make thin films of them. And so we were able to fabricate a broad range of electrodes for water oxidation based on these observations. And so we were able to take materials and we were able to learn about them. We developed new techniques to actually make them. So instead of just using classical electrodeposition techniques to make metal oxide thin films, we used things like ionic liquid precursors. We doped materials into them. We made them from different precursors. And so we were able to actually make a lot of water oxidation catalysts this way. And one of the very important things about these um, materials is that you make them out of common earth materials, as in they're cheap. So you can make all these catalysts and you can make them quite cheaply. Now, I guess one of the things that is interesting, even though we'd made all these catalysts and we still are able to make them, there's still a lot of things we don't understand about them. So one of the things that is an interesting and, and simple observation from my perspective as an X-ray spectroscopist is that if you look at most catalysts actually that you might find on an electrode, in XAS you get a Fourier transform, something like these coloured ones. In fact, these are all functional um, lost my pointer again. Actually, I'm not going to do the pointer because I think it's what causes PowerPoint to crash. Um, if you look at the um, Fourier transform on here, if you compare the dotted line to the coloured lines, you can see that there's a huge difference in intensity, particularly around apparent distance of four or five. Um, this is not an unusual phenomenon from an X-ray spectroscopy perspective, actually. I mean, it's very common to see this phenomenon in metal oxides that are made in soils um, and thin films, biogenic oxides all have these properties. Um, but it was kind of unusual to see them in systems. Also, because people thought these systems were molecular, for many years, I think when people saw this sort of thing, they assumed that it was verification that this system was what they thought it was in the first place. That means a molecular system. Um, it's striking to me now, and we don't just study water oxidation catalysts, we study all sorts of thin films, that it's often the case that when you actually go to look at the thin film, you often see um, a deviation from what is the bulk phase when you look at it in X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So you often see the material start to lose long range order. And we talk about that as being disorder in a material, but we don't always understand what the origin of that is. And we don't always understand what the functional significance of it is. And those were two things I really wanted to understand. Another thing about these systems that was really kind of bugging me actually, was that no matter how we made them, whether we made them out of cobalt or nickel or iridium, thermodynamically they were all made in the same region. So. I know engineers and chemists both um, use Paul Bay diagrams because they're quite useful to map out the redox spaces of materials. Um, and we would see that the really active catalysts would all form in the same range of a material. And I thought this was interesting because for me, this kind of contradicts how we classically think about catalysis. So if you think about what the implications of that particular diagram are, they mean that you've got two chemical reactions that are in thermodynamic equilibrium. So in this slide, I'm going to try and get my laser pointer back, but if my PowerPoint crashes again, it's the end of the laser pointer. Um, you've got here water oxidation, which is just off your undergraduate redox table, and you've got manganese reduction. The physical meaning of these two being like this, being up here, is that they the interformation of them would be zero, that their delta G is zero. Um, but again, that's a bit of a weird thing to say because we wouldn't normally think, for example, about a manganese oxide oxidizing water directly. And the way we would, the reason we would say that is not going to happen because we, we'd say that, oh, but there's big kinetic barriers to this reaction, so it doesn't happen. If we go through and then think about classical heterogeneous catalysts, classical heterogeneous catalysts thinks about things as being surface processes. So in classical heterogeneous catalysis, your process works by binding onto a surface. And we there was a, there's some classical um, catalysis literature by Sabatier that has basically says, if you're gonna bind something to a surface, it can't bind too weakly, it can't bind too strongly, it must be just right. Um, meaning that the delta G of that process is close to zero. But in the previous reaction, what we were actually seeing is a redox process on the surface rather than a surface interaction. And so I found that observation empirically quite interesting. If you ever go to a catalysis conference, they're very fond of divorcing heterogeneous and homogeneous catalysis. But what I showed you on the previous slide was actually that, you know, both of the 
So you can have a catalyst that actually has components that are both heterogeneous and homogeneous as part of the same reaction. And so there are some complications there in our classical definitions of how catalysis actually works. So that led me to ask a couple of questions about how, I, I guess for me, I, I continue to study lots of catalysts and lots of different materials, but one of the things I really wanted to get to the bottom of is how is this disorder and nanostructuring that we're seeing functional in these materials? What is it doing to them that enables those catalytic reactions to work? And the second question I wanted to ask was how redox reactions are important in these catalytic processes. So again, I, I sometimes think when we listen to presentations, we don't think enough about the perspective of the person giving the presentation. So I guess it's important to remember that a lot of my perspective comes from the characterization side. And I want to let you know an important lesson from the, about characterization. If I think about the last hundred years of our impact of physics and chemistry and mineral science on characterization on those fields, um, we have we're really, really good at molecular systems. So when you've got an isolated metal in a solution, we're pretty good at studying that. OK, and likewise, we're at, at the other end of the spectrum when you've got a single crystal or something that's extremely crystalline, we're really good at characterizing that. But a lot of the materials that are of functional significance and where there's a lot of innovations in material science, they're neither molecular systems nor single crystals. They sit in the middle. And these systems are actually quite hard to characterize. Probably it's only since we've got TEM and techniques actually like X-ray absorption that don't rely on a material being in a crystalline state that we've begun to be able to actually understand how these materials that sit in the middle can be distinct from either molecular systems or single crystals. So from a characterization perspective, we've essentially been biased by these things and the crystalline state and the molecular state. And if you don't think you're biased, when you go to characterize your material, one of the things, first things you might do is go, is it, what phase is it? You might run an XRD and determine what phase it is. Often once you know that, you don't necessarily think beyond that phase, okay? But actually, one of the things we're beginning to see is that thinking beyond that phase and how the phase exists is very, very important to understanding and engineering some of its reactivity. Don't die on me, PowerPoint, don't die. Oh. I'm sorry guys, PowerPoint has crashed again. I'm going to reopen it. You'll have to bear with me. Yeah. I haven't had given a lot of lectures this semester and I can't recall having this problem before, so I, I don't... Sorry guys, it's gone to the end of my presentation. <laughs> 
I might actually skip over some parts because I'm not having a lot of success with um, this. Um, so just getting back to what I was talking about with regard to nano size, if we talk about materials and we think about how we characterise them, often we rely on something, for example, crystallography that tells us about the bulk phase, but doesn't necessarily tell us about the, the actual structure of the material. And one of the things we are increasingly realising with all materials, not just catalysts, is that the actual material and how it behaves within itself is very, very important for its actual function. So if we just think about nano size and disorder, there's a lot of things that fall into this category. So one of the simplest and first described was surface area, but often effects beyond surface area are very important. For example, one of the things that we may see is internal structural disorder. We might see effects of shape. So most people are familiar with the difference between graphite and graphene. And, and for example, more generally 2D materials, but 2D materials are also kind of an approximation. So if you have a 2D material, sometimes it, you know, it's presented as this beautiful kind of straight layer, but it can have many, many components to it. You also have things that are composite materials. And I, I mean, different things, this means different things to different people, but you might have two nanoparticles stuck together. You might, for example, notice that the chemistry of the orange square is different to the chemistry of the black square. Uh, sorry, the chemistry of the orange square is modulated by the um, black squares around it. So all of these things can come to play in catalysis. If I got back to the story I wanted to tell you from the beginning, I said, well, you know, people had, you know, isolated photosystem too. And they said, well, isn't it cute? Burnicite kind of looks like photosystem too. And they'd studied it and they had gone, no, nah, it's dead. The problem was they studied this one. They didn't look at the variations in structure that you see within this phase and even how it naturally forms. So if you just precipitate burnicite, what does it initially look like? Not after you've kind of transformed it and made it into a crystalline state. In fact, if you look up a standard synthesis of nearly any mineral um, that's not re referring to nanophase, they've actually probably reported a synthesis that enabled them to get a crystal structure because in the history of mineralogy, um, including burnicide, a lot of focus was put on thorough characterization of materials. And so things that kind of naturally existed in these states, and it's not just minerals, very common materials exist in these states, are often overlooked. And it's important because the properties of these materials can be fundamentally different. Their solubility can be different. Their reactivity can be a little different. So to get to the bottom of this, one of the things we tried to do was to make some series of metal oxides where we systematically engineered disorder into those materials. So um, this is some work for, by Hannah King, who's actually also part of SEAM. Um, so Hannah did this um, work at James Cook where we studied a, quite a famous catalyst um, in the water oxidation community called Nasera's catalyst. And Nasera had um, published, uh, was a Harvard, is a Harvard professor actually, and he published a paper that everyone was talking about because he'd been able to take a cobalt oxide with a little bit of phosphate in it and make a functional um, material that turned over. But nobody necessarily understood why that particular material worked. And there was also a lot of controversy about, about how that material worked as well. So one of the things we tried to do was actually make some bulk amounts of that catalyst. So instead of having it as a thin film, we tried to make material in kind of gram plus quantities that would enable us to actually see some of the reactivity of that material. And we very carefully correlated together TEM and XAS to, to see that we'd made a series, a test set of materials, if you like, that actually engineered different disorder into the material. So in XAS, if I, if you think about the Fourier transform I started with, what Hannah had been able to do here was come up with a series where those high peaks around four to six in the Fourier transform of the XAPS just disappeared. So there was, a, so we were able to actually take that. Um, I'm sorry, guys, I'm still having problems with teams. Okay. And one of the things Hannah was able to see very clearly from making bulk amounts of those phases is that the materials, when she made them more disordered, they were far more reactive, okay? And they were quantitatively more reactive. And this was important, actually, and we believe it is mechanistically important in catalysis. 
Now, I can say to you here that, well, if you have an ordered material and a disordered material, the disordered material is far more reactive and therefore it's more unstable. But if you take that observation and you interpret it in terms of the underlying thermodynamics of the material, those underlying thermodynamic properties are very important. They confer things like additional oxidative efficiency, which is really important for a water oxidation catalyst. In this case, they make the materials less stable, so it can mean a catalyst is more prone to breakdown, and that's a negative property of a material. So understanding these subtle differences in structure between ordered and disordered materials can be very important. In this particular set, all of the oxidation states are the same, yet the material that is most amorphous is the strongest oxidant, not related to the oxidation state, it's actually related to the internal order of the material that actually get, gets its oxidative efficiency. I want to actually show you another example of this type of phenomenon. When we started to see these changes in reactivity of materials, we sought ways to quantify it and begin to explain them because I thought that if I showed people with an X-ray absorption spectra of two materials and said, well, this one's a stronger oxidant, even though its redox state is the same, people would kind of look at me funny. So I wanted to actually show them some implications of the chemistry. One of the funny things, I guess, or not funny things, one of the things um, that any experimental chemist knows is there are things you kind of know when you do reactions on the bench that you don't see perhaps when you present a spectrum. So I was thinking a little bit about manganese oxide chemistry. Manganese oxides are actually very important and very fundamental materials in, in chemistry research. If you ever go to teach catalysis to a group of students anywhere from primary school age to university students, one of the ways we demonstrate a catalytic reaction is to show the classical disproportionation of hydrogen peroxide. So if you take manganese oxide and you put some hydrogen peroxide over it, it explosively decomposes to make water and oxygen. Um, it's also used in the elephant's toothpaste demonstration if any of you have ever done that. If you look at this reaction in thermodynamic space though, manganese oxide is actually a strong enough chemical oxidant that it would oxidize hydrogen peroxide. Most chemists are comfortable with this because they go, oh, but there's a big kinetic barrier, so I know why that reaction doesn't happen and the catalytic reaction happens and they're, they're pretty comfortable with that. But one of the things we, we could see as we started to engineer disorder and make structural changes in manganese oxides is that they react quite differently with hydrogen peroxide. So if you make a, another test set of materials where you introduce different layers of disorder into these materials and look at their bulk reactions, you can actually switch off and switch on the catalytic property of disproportionation by the level of disorder in the material. So what you're seeing here is manganese oxide is dark brown. And when it chemically reduces, so when it acts as an oxidant, it makes manganese 2 plus, which at these concentrations is colourless. So you're actually seeing a demonstration that shows you fundamental differences in thermodynamic activity that are associated with that bulk disorder in a material. Now, if something can change so much and change so dramatically that you see a reaction change colour, then you can begin to understand why such a material can't be overlooked in catalyst design. If that reaction that I just showed you as a video, we could quantify in our materials and we could demonstrate something I think that's quite interesting and important is um, in catalysis, people have a kind of notion that the smaller the particles are, the better the catalytic process is. And this is a direct um, counter example to this. And another thing that people often say is that if it's more disordered, it's a better catalyst. Well, it might be true for some reactions, but in this case, there's another clear counter example because the more disorder you have, the worse reaction, it, the worse catalyst it is, at least for the disproportionation of hydrogen peroxide. And you can clearly see why it's become a stronger chemical oxidant and the direct oxidative reaction competes with the catalytic disproportionation reaction. So quite an interesting observation. I mentioned to you that understanding materials can be challenging and understanding what the structure of the materials is can be challenging. I should fess up to that the manganese oxide materials that I showed you in that previous slide are made via a very, very simple method. If you want to make that manganese oxide method, you take manganese 2 plus and commercial bleach and you, you just mix them together and you get this lovely, really reactive manganese, two, uh, manganese oxide material. Um, I developed the synthetic method for that when I was actually studying a molecular water oxidation catalyst and I looked at the chemical conditions under which people were testing their molecular water oxidation catalysts and they're adding bleach to turn them over and I then wanted simply what the product of manganese 2 plus and bleach was and it made this very nice very disordered manganese oxide material which is perhaps another story. But there's an important story here I need to show you with regard to characterization. So 
I have here actually the data for two manganese oxides. They're both in the previous film. The blue one is an ordered version. It's K plus burnicite. They're both burnicite structures. And the yellow one is 2D, a material I, re I refer to here as 2D MNOX coming from this particular paper we wrote a couple of years ago. 2D MNOX isn't any sort of fancy thing. You might think as a, 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 if I'm going to call it a 2D material, what I might have done is some really hard synthesis where I made something and exfoliated and chucked some big cations in it. Um, no, this material is the product of manganese 2 plus and bleach. So it's a really, really common material that people have seen lots of times. Um, because I wanted to understand something more about its reactivity, I, I, I did a very, very careful characterization of this material. Interestingly, when I look at the XAS, actually the XAS between these two materials is not terribly different. You can see their base structures are the same. This you could probably call within error. This I'd say is slightly different. This I'd also say is slightly different, but they're not hugely different in the XAS. Interesting though, if you look at the powder diffraction or the XRD of these materials, they are different. Um, if you actually look at the synthetic version of the material we refer to as 2D MNOX, um, you actually see an almost complete absence of all the reflections that are associated with the 001, 002, 003 planes. Okay. Now, if you think about a layer material, um, layer materials are stacked, so those planes are associated with those stackings. So there's a couple of reasons why they can be absent in the XRD. Um, one of the reasons is that you have what's called turbostatic disorder, or, or you get your layers mismatched, okay? Um, and that can cause that because the reflections cancel out. But I well, did some work with uh, my colleague Sherry Chang from, she was at the time at Arizona State University, and she had a new detector on. I said, Sherry, from the reactivity, I actually think this is a 2D material, even though I did nothing fancy to it, even though everybody sees it all the time, even though it's incredibly common, I think it's a 2D material and we should have a look at it with TEM. And so we did. And actually, you can tell it's a 2D material because if it wasn't a 2D material, you couldn't get this TEM. And actually, this is a really, um, it doesn't, I know for me, it looks kind of like a knitting pattern, but um, it look, has this kind of knitting pattern look because of the systematic vacancies you have between the layers. Now, this isn't a single layer of um, manganese oxide. It's probably two, or we think it's two or three layers stuck together. Um, but the material forms like this completely naturally. So when you, said, when you take the precipitate of manganese 2 plus in bleach, instead of forming that ordered material, you form this kind of 2D material that's really reactive. I should mention as catalysts, the 2D material is the one that will directly oxidize manganese oxide, and it's 200 times more effective for water oxidation than is K plus burnicide. So you can see that that's a pretty um, huge difference in reactivity we're seeing from two materials that are you know, not very different in terms of, for example, their um, base connectivity, and it must be that higher water structural effect. Um, there's a little bit of a lesson here with regard to XRD, and that is that it can be really, really useful. Um, sometimes if you've got a material that is not um, terribly crystalline, you might need to run the XRD a bit longer. When I did this one, um, we did this at James Cook, and I remember saying to the guy, um, you know, let's not run it for 20 minutes, let's run it for like, you know, overnight for 12 hours, um, just so that we can pull out that signal to noise to actually get that material. And it can be quite useful if you think you've got a, a material that's disordered. So. Don't immediately dismiss XRD um, if you're getting an amorphous material. Maybe what you need to do is account it for a bit longer and then really think about the, the um, diffraction pattern you're getting and have a go at actually trying to simulate the structural changes in that diffraction pattern. So there's quite an important lesson here, and that is that those nano, nanostructural changes can change the underlying thermodynamics of a material. I'm just going to check how I'm going for time here. Um, so that's a very, very important observation. Um, and I guess it's important to note that the underlying thermodynamics can really change everything. So if you're trying to change a reaction, change the selectivity of a reaction, really it's that underlying thermodynamics that can, can actually help govern and engineer those reactions. It's also important because the thermodynamics can actually change the products you get. It can change the susceptibility of a material to things like corrosion. So all of those are important take home lessons. I don't think I have enough time to go into it today, but we've also done a lot of work adapting extra absorption experiments to doing in situ um, type experiments. So quite important in catalysis, that you're actually able to study the materials that you're actually actively interested in. Um, but there's a few take-home lessons, I think, that are important in the context of SEAM and in materials design. 
and that I want to just finish with briefly. So I've told you that, you know, when we have nanostructured materials, this can be really important. And it's funny, I think when people think about effects of nanoscale, I don't have a picture of this here, I think one of the first things people go is, oh, have you thought about quantum confinement, Rosalie? Have you thought about surface area? And I'll say yes and yes. And I said, the problem is it doesn't just end there, okay? Effects of the nanoscale can be complex and they can be different, but I also think they can be useful. So if you know that, for example, if you get a if you if you get a diffraction pattern of a material, you might know that it's kind of dark light, dark light, dark light, but you don't know if the shape is like this or like this. Whether that's important or not, I don't know, but it can be important. You also can have things like internal structural disorder that can make things much more reactive or have different reactivity than what you previously thought about. I've also, I didn't talk about them today, but we've been recently studying some catalysts that actually have two components in them. So they have a, a catalytic component and another component which changes the underlying chemistry of the catalytic component. In fact, we didn't go out there and design those materials. They were they, they were given to me as, Rosalie, we've got this catalyst um, and it works really well in acid, but this material should dissolve in acid, but it still works. And so we went and actually had a look at it and we're seeing that the actual kind of um, packaging of the catalyst, if you like, changes its underlying thermodynamics and stability enough that you can actually make a catalyst that previously couldn't work in acid, work in acid. But as I mentioned, I think there's a lot of implications when we're trying to design surfaces, when we're trying to do surface engineering, because if we are having, you often see disordered materials naturally form at things like grain boundaries on surfaces. And if you can understand the implications of what you're forming, and understand what the implications and reactivity are, that gives you kind of new tools to design new materials. And I think that's very important. All the things I'm talking about today, when we're talking about engineering disorder, engineering reactivity, most of the time they're not difficult and they're not expensive. So if it's almost like kind of a cancellation of errors in, in mineralogy, people made all this effort to figure out synthesis for things that were ordered, okay? But it's almost easier sometimes to make the nanomaterials if you understand what you're doing. They're not necessarily expensive. The starting components are not necessarily um, expensive things. So it actually gives you a whole new range of properties that you can access if you can understand where they're coming from. I'm going to leave it there, guys. And you have my sincerest apologies for all the PowerPoint problems I've had today. I've not, as I said, I've not really experienced those sorts of problems before doing Teams presentations. So um, I appreciate you all bearing with me today. I, that leaves me to thank all the many people who've helped me. Um, the work I presented today was primarily that of Hannah King and Mayada Savory, who are my first two PhD students. Um, and I also want to thank Andrew for getting me involved in, and also for, I should also thank Peter Kingshot and um, Professor Chris Burnt for getting me involved in SEAM, because I think the interest in science is sometimes about how to find applications for things you've already been, you, you sort of think about one thing, but thinking about that cross-disciplinary collaboration where you can grow in new new ways you hadn't previously thought of. And I want to thank all the Beamline scientists and people from um, my collaborator, um, Alexander Simonov from WASH, and my long-term collaborator, Professor Sherry Chang, from who's just moved to take up a position at New South Wales, and to thank all of you for listening. Cool. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Rose. And uh, uh, well done with uh, adapting to the new Teams format. I think you uh, you handled it quite well with the, the failings. Um, Actually, Peter, and, uh, I don't think that's normal. I don't. I've not had those crashing problems before, so I don't know quite what's going on with our Teams today. But um, but we apologise for that, and you you, you <laughs> managed to get through it well, which is a uh, tribute to you. So we have a couple of questions. Let let me start off with the first one. It's quite a long one. Okay. How can we know if the power of the X-ray ignition ignites, sorry, the molecular change of the metal oxides during the characterization? So that's the first part. For example, amorphous uh, manganese oxide that we need to understand might uh, be shifted closely to its crystalline phase or its uh, turbocrastic phase. Is it possible for this phenomenon to happen with uh, sensitive photocatalysts, particularly manganese and iron sulfides, or simply how stable is your synthesized catalyst under ambient conditions? I think the first, the answer to the first part is about, I think about X-ray damage and or, or electron damage if you're running TEM. And I think those are things we've always got to think about. So. We have strategies to look at those things. Um, one of the strategies is simply to take a spectrum really fast and to take another one and see if it's changed. 
But that in and of itself isn't enough. Um, you often want to compare analytical techniques. One of the things, of interesting things about X-rays um, being X-ray absorption and electrons being TEM is that they often have opposite effects in terms of chemical damage. So by combining them, you can get a good understanding of materials. But it is an issue, do, do the chemicals change? And it is something you always have to watch for. So we, we have protocols in place. And certainly sometimes we do think we get beam damage and in TEM you see it, you see changes in the images as you take them. In extra absorption you also see it. How stable are the materials? Um, this is an interesting um, observation too. I think some of them are more stable than others. So when I moved to Swinburne we had to clean up my lab at James Cook and I'd had a range of students been making some cobalt oxides. Actually Hannah had um, the cobalt cage data that Hannah had was some of those materials. Um, they're cobalt three oxides and we generally think they're quite air stable and robust. So the, certainly the crystalline one is quite air stable and you're not really bothered by having that one on the bench. But when we went to clean up the lab, we noticed that the ones that were really dark that were originally cobalt three had obviously reduced to cobalt two. And what that means is they're strong oxidants. So they'd found something in the air to oxidize and then decompose. Now that happened over a period of months. Um, but some of the things you make, they are really unstable. And we actually go to great efforts. I didn't, I, with all the problems I had, I didn't get a chance to talk to you about our in situ X-ray experiments. Sometimes you have to do a lot of freeze capture of materials. You have to keep them very cold in order to actually keep them in their amorphous state. Sometimes too, in turnover, things only exist for short periods of time. And so you have to be mindful of that as well. So there's a lot of kind of complex discussion to be had in that space where, yes, things can be very reactive and anything that is gonna be a very strong oxidant or a very strong reductant, almost by definition will be really reactive. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's the best I can do. Uh, thanks, Rosalie. I think you covered um, it all. So an another question uh, from Aaron. You, you mentioned catalysis studies and corrosion. Can you uh, elaborate a bit more on, on what you meant by this? Well, in corrosion, you look at the formation of a product. OK, so if you're corroding a surface, whether it's an oil rig by you know, metal sulfide corrosion and you've got make ba you're making bacteria that make um, HS minus that then react with the metal. Usually it ne you need to actually make a, pro you need to react it with that metal to make a product. Now on surfaces that I've seen, not all metals are equal. You often get little points on surfaces that are actually far more reactive than other points on the surfaces. And they're often where you get a fault in, in your, your grain boundary. So if you can actually understand where those faults are and, and correct them, you can sometimes control some of the corrosion processes. Um, yes, corrosion can also be catalytically mediated as well. Um, sometimes it can be self-catalyzed, depending on what the corrosion reaction is. So perhaps that's a bit more of a complex discussion to have at some point with somebody. Thanks. Uh, I, I don't have any more questions from the audience, but perhaps I, I can ask one. So, so Rosalie, you, you talked about this order disorder sort of transition a lot, yeah. and I think you, it, it's a very important point. And you, you also mentioned the in situ studies that you do. Is it possible to actually reverse the process? So if you start uh, ordered and then in situ slowly change to an ordered state and then reverse it back, can, can you do that in a can that actually be done with the catalyst you're talking about? And do you think it's possible in situ to do that? Um, I think the disorder depends on the system, Peter. So, for example, if you precipitate out a cobalt oxide, if you just precipitate it from cobalt two, you might get a disordered system like a nanoparticle. But if you, for example, precipitate it from cobalt two with a little bit of something that disrupts its lattice structure like phosphate, you'll, you'll almost consistently get a disordered system. And I think that is true for not just cobalt oxides, for a very broad range of materials where you can take um, materials, even things like calcium carbonate, which we don't even think about. Um, and if you have a little tiny bit of magnesium, it completely changes its things like its KSP value. So yes, I think these processes can be reproducible, but it's not always simple to just reproduce them. So you have it's not as simple as making a cobalt oxide out of cobalt and oxygen. You, you need to think about what is in there that's causing that lattice disruption. It, it might be because you make the material fast and you get lots of grain boundaries, but maybe that's not enough to make a consistent product, if you, if you know what I mean. So maybe then you need to think more about the formulation of the system. 
such that you can do what you're saying and make the disorder reversible? So yes, I think you can, but it's a system design question. Okay. So so thanks, Rosalie. Just a follow up from Darren who said, thank you for that uh, example of pitting corrosion, which initi initiates, propagates, then terminates. Inclusions also being uh, initiation sites for pitting. So thanks again. So I think that's a, a very important point you make, Rosalie, and perhaps a, a bigger discussion not only within SIEM but uh, but beyond that. So th I don't see any other questions. We still have a, a little bit of time. Maybe I can ask ask one more, Rosalie. Um, well, I've, I've obviously got a few questions, but the the one that came to mind was, and, and you touched on it there with um, adding other components to your pure systems. Um, impurities and um, catalyst uh, efficiencies. Uh, we talk about poisoning, etc., in, in general catalysis terms. But for your analysis, um, do you or, or are you able to see very low concentrations of impurities um, in in the say the XAS spectra? I mean, what what would be the, what the impurity is? So we're really good with metals, but we're not really good with other impurities. So. For example, if you have a cobalt catalyst that has a small amount of nickel in it, yes, we can follow the nickel. And that probably gets down to, mm, let's say, sub 0.5% of the total material. It's not super low, but I mean, of the total cobalt. So um, sim similar to XPS, I guess. Yeah, it probably does have similar. Um, mm. You might be able to get further than that in the zanes, but they start to interfere with each other a little bit in your right. observation of the XAFs as well. XAFs has a lot of ambiguities too. and. One of my little bit of frustrations at the moment in the literature is that people tend to pick it up and they interpret it as they think it should be, sometimes as opposed to presenting the possible interpretations that exist. So it's very common at the moment, for example, for people to put nitrogen dopants in things like metals and then go, oh, we've made a single atom catalyst or we've made this site. And sometimes there's multiple interpretations of the XAS. And I would say XAS is less good at distinguishing those things because often they can be interpreted in multiple ways. So it, yeah, it very much depends on what the impurity is. If you've got two phases present and they're both, for example, the same metal. So if you've got a, if I took that manganese catalyst and I had a um, manganese four and a manganese two, I could probably tell down to about one or two percent the manganese two. But at some point, it, it you reach a limit of detection. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it very much depends on what the impurity is. Okay. Th thanks. So we we don't have any more questions. Um, from the audience. Maybe I'll ask one more, Rosie, while we're there. We, haven't, we don't see each other very often. So, no. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, getting back to the corrosion point, um, a, a lot of corrosion that we're interested in um, happens in liquid environments, of course. Um, you mentioned bacteria, for example. I mean, are, are there ways of looking at a sort of real environment um, where the corrosion is actually taking place? Um, well, How would we go about, about studying that? I've been thinking a bit about this too, Peter, because I thought, well, maybe if we design an in situ cell for catalysis, we could design an in situ cell that looks at the spatial um, effects of corrosion in a culture or something like. So you were talking about pitting corrosion. I've always thought that was a very interesting phenomena too, for a lot of reasons. And um, I had thought, I, one of the things I think that some of the new X ray, both the X ray absorption, but some of the imaging techniques, they can give us spatial and chemical information at the same time. And over the sort of submicron scale, so I'm not talking kind of atomic level, I'm talking. So if you think, I, I think a lot of the big questions, actually, both in energy science, but in corrosion and in a lot of electrochemical phenomena, they're not, you know, molecular level questions. We kind of understand what the phase is sometimes, but we want to understand how the electron migration works to and from the site or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the imaging techniques might be very helpful for that. Um, so to actually look at, you know, we've got a new, uh, Australia is getting a new microtomography beam line. I think it might be interesting to think about whether we could kind of do a kind of a mix match of XAS combined with an imaging protocol to look at the formation of some of these processes over time. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be quite instructive. Um, I don't think I'll let you finish your question properly, so I'm going to let you finish now. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you, you you captured most of it. Yeah, I I, I agree. The the techniques that that um, that uh, we we look at these systems with um, are quite quite broad. I was also thinking of something like a, a nano sims or a or a yes. toff sims, potentially also OJ um, atmospheric XPS. If you can get the resolution down to the the scale you're talking about, would be 
potentially useful in this respect. But yeah, it's it's underexplored. And um, I think some of these questions, like um, sometimes they relate to both the spatial and the chemical, and we haven't really got our head around the spatial. Like, um, how do I put it? sometimes in science, what what is happening is more apparent when you can visualize it. Um, and I mean, like, you know, in biology, when we got to the point we could look at metals in cells, we suddenly realised, you know, how zinc distribution work through the vascular systems and all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think I suspect some of these corrosion processes are a little bit like that. We need to really have a hard think about how we can visualise what's going on, because I think that might be actually quite insightful for controlling those processes. And I, I don't know that I think it's as much a molecular level. It might be a little bit of a molecular level problem, but some of it also might be a bit of an electron transport through space problem. Mm, okay. I want to too. I'm just that's my two cents on it, and well, I'm very interested so, in the problems yeah. too. So if I can help, let me know. <laughs> yeah, certainly. While I mean, all the ideas uh, about how we go about understanding are, are important here, so that we have to consider everything. So there's one one last question from Min before we finish. So what is the drawback of the coating made from green leaf, that is manganese oxide catalyst, for example, in electricity generation? Oh, well, the manganese oxide is just not as efficient as nickel iron. I mean, it's interesting from an evolutionary perspective, and you could ask why nature didn't do nickel iron, and it's probably because nature naturally precipitates out those manganese oxides in a fairly pure way um, because the redox gradients of iron and manganese are very different. I suspect that's the evolutionary implication of that. But, um, I mean, I don't necessarily think there are such big um, problems with it. I mean, I think you can build alkaline electrolyzers out of nickel iron oxyhydroxides. They work pretty well. Um, I think the big issues around hydrogen probably are not so much generating it anymore, although they're not saying there's not room for improvement there. I think they're on what you do with it once you've made it and also how to make it in an intermittent way so that you can turn on the electrolyzer when the, uh, you know, you've got sunlight and you're not running it, you're not good at burning your electrolyzer with Victorian brown coal, which is, you know, worse than doing, um, making it from methane. <laughs> so... Like, I think there's those questions. I, I think there's interesting questions in like, you know, how do you make an electrolyzer work in conch acid and things like that, which uh, are still material science questions. But I think there's a lot of work already done in this area. So yeah, especially in the last decade, I think people have um, sort of, even I'm sort of seeing that water oxidation, we sort of got to the point we can do it. And probably the next questions are around making other products other than hydrogen. Okay, thanks, Rosalie. Okay, I think um, we're a bit over time, so we'll we'll end the um, uh, the webinar there, and we we thank uh, quietly clapping uh, Rosalie once again for her. Uh, I apologise again for the problems with PowerPoint. So, um, it was a bit disruptive, and I'm sorry for that. And thank you for hanging in there, guys. <laughs> thanks. All right, take care, everybody. See you.